بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم لا علم الا ما علمتنا انك انت الحكيم العليم اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والاكرام اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك ان يا ذا الجلال والاكرام اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والاكرام وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم خير العرب والعجم والانام وعلى اله وصحابته ومن تبعهم باحسان الحمد لله I want to say first off that the topic is daunting to say the least. I certainly don't claim in any way to have all of the answers. Uh, it's something that I've certainly given a lot of thought. And I was thinking on the way on the airplane actually that I really in a sense don't have anything uh, to add to this discourse that's original because this condition that we find ourselves in which is in a sense exacerbated uh, in the present times for a number of reasons is nonetheless a condition that this ummah has been in for quite some time and some far more uh, scholarly and more uh, intelligent people than myself or others have looked at it and considered it quite deeply written several books and many many talks given many lectures and yet the process goes on and continues and as i was thinking that the ayah in the quran came to me i looked out the window actually wa dhakir fa inna dhikra tanfa' al mu'minin remind people because the reminder benefits the people of iman and so in a sense we have nothing uh, to offer any more Uh, in terms of the discourse, the people speaking in this age, other than reminders in the hopes that ourselves and that others will begin to heed the reminders. And this is the purpose of dhikr, that we remember. If you look at uh, the title about understanding the past, looking at the present condition, and attempting to look at some possible ways of change for the future. The first thing that I'd like to point out is that I want to use a medical model. It's useful, I think it's Quranic, because the Quran says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, قَدْ جَأَتْكُمْ مَوْعِدَةٌ مَرَبِّكُمْ This Quran has come down as a mu'idah, an exhortation, and Allah says that it is a uh, that is the rahma it's a mercy and it's a shifa it's a healing it's a shifa lima fi sudur for what's in the breast of diseases and illnesses and so the language of medicine is the language of the quran and the prophets now when you look at a disease or an illness there are certain things that you have to examine first you have to look at the nature of the illness what is its Uh, characteristics and illnesses have many many different aspects one of them is uh, in, in, in medical uh, tradition you look at what are called signs and symptoms now a sign generally there's probably people in here uh, that are studying medicine or are maybe doctors or nurses or people in that medical profession but a sign is something that is objective, that the one observing can see it. And a good physician is the one who learns to literally see signs that lesser physicians don't see. In other words, they see things that the average person doesn't see. So a sign is an objective outward manifestation. Or it could be an inward now because we use uh, very sophisticated Uh, ways of measuring blood and cells and, and these types of things. Then there's also what's called a symptom. And a symptom is something that is articulated by the patient. The patient tells the physician what's wrong. I have a pain here. Well, what kind of pain? It's a sharp pain because I can't tell that. If, I, if I'm taking a case history, I can't tell that, that it's a sharp pain. That has to be told to me and that's a symptom. 
The sign is that there's swelling, that it's red. Those are signs we can see outwardly. So we have to know the nature, its signs and its symptoms. And then we have to know the cause. What is the cause of the problem? The illness itself has a cause. And this is called etiology, trying to understand where does this disease come from. Now when you look etiologically at an illness, you have different aspects of it. You have a, what they call, causa profundus, a very deep, profound cause. You have causa occasionalis, something, an occasional cause. For instance, somebody could have asthma, but it's a stress that suddenly brings it on. You see, that's not the cause of the disease. That's simply a, a, an occasional cause. It's something that emerges and actually wakes up, a sleeping illness. Right? And this is something that stress does. So you have superficial causes and you have deep causes. Now, if you look uh, in the world, the vast majority of what we read in newspapers, what we read in magazines are very superficial causes. If they're causes at all, they generally tend to be signs and symptoms. And this culture is brilliant at articulating signs and symptoms, and yet they have not a clue as to the cause the underlying diseases that are affecting humanity, that are afflicting humanity in any time and place. They have no understanding whatsoever because they know the outward of this world. They know the outward of this world. They can elicit the signs. But they do not know the inward. They don't know the cause. And the greatest cause of all things is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're the furthest from knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ultimately the only cause that everything else in fact is means so we have to look at the cause and it has superficial aspects but we have to look also deeply at it and then we have to understand the prognosis which is what does this mean generally because the Quran is filled with prognosis how does it tell us the prognosis? By looking at the ancients. By showing us the same signs and symptoms. Telling us what the cause was and then saying, if you get the same disease that they had, then you have the same prognosis that they had. And this is again and again in the Quranic narrative. It comes again and again. We see the same affliction. They don't come with anything new. I guarantee you, read the Qur'an, look at the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed, they come with nothing new, the same old game. The people playing today are the same players, they change the names, but they're the same players. We have our archetypes, and I'm going to talk inshallah about the archetype of Qarun because he's a fascinating Qur'anic archetype. Allah doesn't tell us about these people to tell us about some story that happened in the past. When Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu was reminding Muawiyah radiallahu anhu about the people that were hoarding gold. And he quoted the ayah, الذين يكنزون الذهب والفضة Those who are hoarding gold and silver, Muawiyah radiallahu anhu said, نزلت في أهل الكتاب يا أبو Dhar. That ayah was revealed in the people of the book. He said, نزلت فيهم عبرة لنا. It was revealed about them as a way of taking a lesson. The felicitous one is the one who takes heed from the afflictions of others so that he doesn't fall into the same afflictions. So we have to look at how then do we prognosticate? How then do we uh, predict? According to the Quranic grid, where we are headed if we don't change our ways. And this is very important. Now, not only a prognosis, there are two types of prognosis. There's a prognosis if you don't take a cure. Here's what generally will happen. This is what the doctor says. But, there's another prognosis. And that is, if you take the cure, now the difference between their medicine and the Quranic medicine, that al kitabu la This is a book, there's no doubt. 
In their medicine, it's conjecture. 95 out of the statistical studies that we've taken, 95% of the people that do this treatment get better. Well, what if you're in that 5%? You're not in 5%. It's 100% for you that you didn't get better, right? So their science is not exact. It's based on conjecture. It's based on a type of kahana, what the Quran calls kahana, really. And also on hukum al-ada, which is making a judgment based on repetitive uh, events and occurrence, occurrences. Now, to look at understanding the past, where do we go? The first thing in understanding the past, there are two types of pasts that we can examine. I'm sure there's others, but these are the ones I'm concentrating on. The two types, there's understanding spiritually what took place in the past and understanding material what took place in the past materially. If we look at the matter from a spiritual point of view or, and I would have a slash there, unseen, al-ghayb. In trying to understand the past, we have to understand what are the spiritual and the unseen influences that are involved in the history of the human being. Because these are real. The materialist denies them. He says there's nothing other than the material world. And some of them, like Hume or Kant, they say there might be other things, but we can't know them. The only thing we can know is the material world, and therefore we're cut off from it. And this is uh, Kant's whole critique of the ability of the human being, of reason itself as a way of understanding the supra-phenomenal world, the noumena or the world that goes beyond this stuff here. We can't understand it. It's impossible. So we cannot know metaphysics. In the end, what's beyond this natural world, it's not worth studying anymore. And now we move into deep material sciences. And so the pursuit of man in the Western world, which is very different from the Muslim world, and inshallah I'll try to get to that. The, the pursuit of the Western man, because again, in understanding our past, there are two pasts now that we really have to understand. We have to understand the past of the Ahl al-Kitab, and we have to understand the past of the people of Islam. Because the other players in this global scene are really, when we look at them historically, they do not have the same impact on Islam that the Ahl al-Kitab have. Al-Yahud wa nasara And when the Prophet sallallahu said that تَتَّبِعِنَّا سَنَنَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْرِكُمْ شِبْرًا بِشِبْرًا ذِرَعًا بِذِرَعًا حَتَّى رَوْ سَرَكُوا جِحْرَ الضَّبِّنَّا سَرَكْتُمُوهُ قَالُوا Al-Yahud wa nasara Istifhaman Istighraab Al-Yahud wa nasara Ya Rasulullah Min al-Qawm illa ha'ula You will follow those who went before you the ways they went hand span by hand span, arms linked by arm linked, to the point if they go down the lizard's hole, you'll go down the lizard's hole as well. And in a riwayah in the Mishkat, حَتَّى لَوْ كَانَ مِنْهُمْ مَنْ أَتَى أُمُّهُ عَلَى نِيَّةِ لَكَانَ مِنْ أُمَّةِ مَنْ فَعَلَى ذَلِكَ Oh, come on. Even if there was one of them that went to his mother sexually, there would be somebody from my ummah that imitated them in that. Now the Prophet sallallahu he does not speak from passion. When they asked him, will we follow the Jews and the Christians, Ya Rasulullah? He said, who are the people? Men and nas. Who are the umam? Who are the nations? Who are the civilizations other than those people? In other words, not that there weren't other civilizations. There were, and the Prophet sallallahu was aware of that. There were the Dravidians, the Hindu Kush, the... Uh, the, the Chinese, the Confucianist culture, the Japanese culture. But we are talking about the impact. Who is being imitated today? The Jew and the Christian. Nobody's imitating the, uh, the Japanese. People aren't walking around dressed like samurai. They're wearing jeans and t-shirts and, and cowboy and baseball caps. When the Chinese president came here, that's what he did. He put on the cowboy hats and went to the hoe down, right? Not like hoe is a Chinese name, that's hoe down is what they do in Texas or something like that. <laughs> that's what he did. You see, he comes and you look, 
It's amazing. It's interesting because in the pictures that they showed in the magazine, his wife, because China is still a deeply conservative culture, and when you see Hillary Clinton next to his wife, his wife is what these people would call a wallflower. She's a non-entity. There's no personality being expressed, and next to her is this uh, woman, uh, glamorously turning 50. Right? <laughs> They work very hard at it. <laughs> so people aren't imitating these people. They're imitating these people here, the Europeans and the Americans, and in particular the Americans, uh, which is a very interesting phenomenon. So we have outwardly, when we look at attempting to understand the past, there are two pasts going on that we have to be concerned with as Muslims, as attempting to analyze and understand the age we're living in, because we cannot be ignorant of our age. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq mentioned in his Qawaid that in the Suhuf of Ibrahim, the Prophet ﷺ was quoted as saying in the Suhuf of Ibrahim, one of the wisdoms that Ibrahim ﷺ was given was عَلَى الْمَرْءِ أَنْ يَكُونَ عَارِفًا بِزَمَانِهِ that it is upon, incumbent upon an individual to know the age that he is living in, to take hold of his tongue, because that's the milak, that's the thing that will allow you to possess all of good in Islam, is to hold your tongue, and then to get on with what is your business. The Prophet ﷺ said, مِنْ حُسْنِ إِسْلَامَ الْمَرْءِ تَرْكُهُ مَا لَا يَعْنِي From the good Islam of an individual is that he leaves what is not any concern to him. So, in understanding this past, we have to know the Muslim past and the European and American past also. And I can't do that for you. You have to do your homework. The Muslims have to look and they have to look in an intelligent way, in a sophisticated way, not in these simplistic ways that we've been given to looking at things for some time, looking at superficial causes, talking about the superiority of technology, as this is some cause in which the Muslims are defeated. SubhanAllah, if there's anybody in this auditorium that still believes that, they haven't read the Qur'an. And if they've read it, they have not understood it. Because the Muslims have never been defeated because of Udda or Adad. They're never defeated because of Udda or Adad. And just to, it's very interesting to note, many people don't know this. But between the period of 1920, the early 20s to about 1938, there was active resistance against the French in Morocco. Abdul Karim al Rifi, Jazahullah Khairan, wa Rahimahu Allah, one of the great mujahids of this century, killed three times as many French, his people, his army, during that period, than were killed in World War I. People don't know that. They don't know that the Muslims were putting up a resistance. Now, there are causes that have to be understood. We have to understand what they are in a deep way, so we have to look at history because history explains many things to us. Now if you look at, and you can understand it at an archetypal level, you can really do without history if you have a deep and profound understanding of the Qur'an. I guarantee you, if you have a deep and profound understanding of the Qur'an, because Qur'an is history at its archetypal level. It is history in, that is constantly repeating itself. And by archetype, I don't mean it in, I'm really using it idiosyncratically. I mean it simply that it is explaining to us human phenomena. So we can see the pattern repeated again and again. We can see Musa and Fir'aun and see that struggle with all of the prophets and the oppressors. We can see that struggle again and again and that's why it's repeated so many times in the Qur'an. So at looking now to look at some spiritual and material forces, we can go back to the first and primary concerns, which takes you to the Quranic narrative in understanding what goes wrong right from the very beginning. Because the Quranic narrative is very powerful in that Adam 
his wife Hawa and Shaitan are three, they are the three important creative figures that must be understood in the Quran. We believe that they existed, that they are real, and, and that the story is not a, a mythology, it's not a narrative. Adam alayhi salam is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from water and clay, as we all know, which modern science has added nothing to that statement. Nothing whatsoever. Modern science has added nothing to that statement. Because you can take apart this human creature and you will find water and earth. That is what we're made out of. From it we came and to it we returned. That's reality. So the Quranic is not pre-scientific. It is science at its most accurate, descriptive state. And I say that because it speaks in a language that not some arcane group of scientists can understand, but it is open for everyone to understand. Adam السلام, is created as a Khalifa. And there are different stories that the Mufassirin relate. Iblis, the Imam al-Qurtubi says that he was an angel, that he was in the highest gathering. Other of the Mufassirin say that he was not, that he was from the jinn, but he was allowed in to the angelic realm. But the point is, is that Iblis was a knower. He, was, he knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He had tawheed. And he was worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was actually sent to the earth to subdue, according to uh, Imam al-Razi, to subdue a rebellion of the jinn on the earth. He came back and he was told that Allah is placing a khalifa in the earth. This was Adam alayhi salam. And he was told when the angels were brought forth in the presence of Adam alayhi salam, they were told to bow down to Adam. And they bowed down. They went into prostration, sajadu. Now this is not uh, shirk. The angels do not commit shirk. They were not bowing down in worship. This is called sajda to tishrif. It's a sajda of honoring, and it was something that was done in the pre-Islamic times. The Prophet ﷺ abrogated it. His sharia prohibited it. And he did not allow it. A man made sajda to him, and he prohibited it. He didn't say, you're a mushrik. He knew what he was doing. He was honoring him because the man had tawheed. He was a student of the Prophet ﷺ. He studied with... The, and the first thing the Prophet ﷺ taught was La ilaha illallah. He didn't teach anything before that. That was the first message of our Prophet ﷺ. La ilaha illallah. And if you understand that, you cannot. If you understand that correctly, you cannot commit shirk. That is what removes a person from the boundaries of the mushrikeen. So they were commanded to bow down, not as mushrikeen, but commanded by Allah to honor Adam in that way. All of them bowed down immediately. And we know there's a discourse that took place before this when Allah told them that he was in the ja'irun fil ardi khalifa. It was not a, they were not opposing Allah's wisdom in placing a khalifa. They were attempting to understand because of what they'd previously seen done by the jinn on the earth. They were making analogy that these people will do the same. And Allah said, I know what you don't know. All of them bowed down except Iblis. Istakbar. Iblis was arrogant. Now if you look, what is the illness there? What is the disease? The fundamental disease is envy. This is the disease of Iblis. It's envy. Now, I want to look at a very interesting Explanation. This was written by a Danish man. Envy is concealed admiration. An admirer who senses that devotion cannot make him happy will choose to become envious of that which he admires. He will speak a different language, and in this language he will now declare that that which he really admires is a thing of no consequence. Something foolish, illusory, perverse, and high-flown. Admiration is happy self-abandon. Envy, unhappy self-assertion. I think it's a very profound definition of envy, because what he's saying there, you see, Iblis knows this is a creation of Allah, and Iblis knows 
Iblis knows Allah. Allah doesn't make sense. Ma kharaqtu hadha batira. Allah, ma kharaqtu hadha batira. You did not create this in vain. This is not vanity. This is not some uh, foolish thing. Allah did not create Adam as some foolish creation. And Iblis knows this. But Iblis thinks that in admiring Adam a.s., he will not be happy. He will not be happy. In fact, he becomes angry because he's envious. Hasid is the disease of Iblis. He is envious. And he says, you created him from mud. I'm created from fire, from air and fire. I'm superior to him. This is saying he's a thing of no consequence. I'm a thing of importance. Why are you having them bow down to him and not to me? This is very important. And inshallah, I want to return to this, especially with Qarun. Now, at that point, Iblis is cast out from the inner circle, from the mela. And Iblis is told, he says, give me time, give me respite. You see, give me respite. And then he tells Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes an oath in the same way that you led me astray. Just as you have led me astray. He blames his hawaya on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He blames his going astray. And this is the nature of the envious one. He blames the other. And this is important when I get back to understanding the present condition of the Muslims. He blames the other. And he says, you did this to me. And then he says, that we are no majma'een. So I'm now, this is how foolish Iblis is. You led me astray and now I'm going to lead them astray. You see, spite. And he promises to do that. Except those of ikhlas, the people of ikhlas, and not mukhlisin. Mukhlasin is a passive form, people of ikhlas with tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, he promises Allah, you won't find them giving thanks, shukr. He promises. He doesn't want them to give thanks. So in Iblis we have two very important qualities. One is ingratitude. He's an ingrate. And the other is envy. He's envious. So this is important in understanding our past. Because this relates very profoundly to the human condition. And to fundamental causes for strife and grief within the human uh, circumstances that we find ourselves in. Now... At the other spectrum, this is a more negative in terms of unseen influences. There are other unseen influences. So you have shaitan as an unseen factor in the human uh, situation. You have other factors involved here. One, and the most primary, is the fact of revelation. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen out of his bounty to send human beings to communicate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's intentions to his creation. Now if you look at this, it's very important to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his intentions to his creation, what he's telling, what his irada is for his creation, where his rida, his contentment lies, he sends human beings, not angels, human beings. And he sends them amongst the people. And he sends them with the language that they understand. There are people that eat. There are people that sleep. There are people that have human needs. They are not from the angelic realm. They are human beings. And Allah has sent them continuously since the beginning of the human condition until the last one was sent over 1400 years ago who is our Prophet وسلم, And we have the honor of being from his community. So revelation here is guidance from Allah. There is an unseen factor which is misguiding creation. And there is an unseen factor which is creating or bringing into existence guidance for the human condition. So you have both of these factors. You have an unseen element that is misguiding 
and you have an unseen element that is guiding. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us and tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who guides whom He pleases and He leads astray whom He pleases. In other words, we are not dualists or manichaeists. Like previous traditions, we do not believe in the God of darkness, Ahura Mazda and Ahriman. We're not like the Majus. We're not like the Jewless who believe in two opposing gods. No. We believe in the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Khayrihi wa Sharrihi, Hulwihi wa Murrihi. It's good and it's bad. It's abundance and it's want. It's sweetness and it's bitterness. And shaitan is from the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why our Tawheed is so essential to understanding this situation. Now, you have some other unseen factors there. You have the angelic realm, which is re it's part of the, the, the realm of guidance, but, and it, there is an element that is related to revelation, but you have an angelic realm. In this room there are angels. These are real entities. They exist. This is not imagination. It is not mythology. They are real and they are present and with us. We have guardian angels, al hafaza We have a guardian angel before us and behind us, according to the Qur'an. We have a, an angel on the right and on the left. One is responsible for writing the hasanat and the other is responsible for writing the sayyat, the good and the bad. And the one who writes the bad is under the charge of the one who writes the good. He cannot write the good until he takes permission. He cannot write the bad until he takes permission. And the, the angel who writes the good tells him to wait to see if the man makes tawbah during a certain period of time. So this is real. There are khawatir malakiya. There are angelic inspirations that come to the human being. Just as there are khawatir shaitaniya. Nafsiya, from the nafs, from shaitan, there are also suggestions that come from the angelic realm and these are having an influence on the human being. And depending on the purity of the human being is the greater the influence is. The more pure an individual comes, the more strong the angelic influence is on that individual. And it moves into the realm of hevel. Not the isma, because the isma is for the prophets alone. They have impeccability, they cannot fall into error, but there is a type of protection as an individual moves higher and higher into that realm of purity of the self. Now, if you move, and I could go, but the time is limited, if you move, to, you can go into nafs, hawa, dunya, shaitan, the enemies of the human being. But I want to go a little bit into the material world now. Looking at the, we have to understand that that's there and it's important because we're not materialists. You see the materialists, if you read uh, Montgomery Watts, who's a Christian, he should know better, but he doesn't. Montgomery Watts, in a book he wrote on Spain, he says, and when these uh, Muslim hordes came over, he might not use that word, but when these Muslims came over, uh, their main goal, and I'm paraphrasing, their main goal was conquest, you see, and they wanted booty. Now, were you there, Mr. Watts? No, seriously. Did you know the intentions of all of those people? Or are you simply making an analogy of the people that you know? Or maybe your own self? You see, this is how the materialist interprets it. And the munafiq is similar to that. When Abu Dhar al-Ghifari and Abdurrahman bin Auf brought in, the one brought gold for the ghazwa and the other brought dates. The munafiqun said, Abdurrahman yura'i, he wants to show up. And they said about Abu Dhar, he wants to be mentioned. This is a disease in the heart. You see, in other words, they are projecting their own diseased hearts onto pure human beings whose intentions were Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger. They were not diseased people. By the shahada of the Prophet himself sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were not diseased. But they are being considered as having these ulterior motives 
axes to grind because those very people with those mo motives are projecting their own internal reality onto the internal reality of these other people and it's not applicable because we do not have that. I was commanded to judge by the outward. Did you split open his heart and look into it when Usama killed the man who said La ilaha illallah and he said Qad قَدْ نَافَقَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ He was doing it out of hypocrisy. أَشَقَقْتَ عَنْ قَلْبِهِ Did you split open his heart and look into it? And in another riwayah, he kept repeating to him. And he said, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Until Usama said, I wish that I hadn't became a Muslim until that day. You see, and so this is how the Prophet ﷺ was teaching his people. That intentions are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's alone. Now we can see signs of a munafiq. We can see signs of a munafiq. You see. Allah has given us signs of hypocrites. They have signs. But to judge a person is a very dangerous thing to do. To judge their intentions. And this is what the materialist does. So we have to recognize these other forces, these other realities that uh, the materialist will not look at because he only knows the outward of this world. Now, when we move to the material, we have to keep the spiritual in mind. But when we move to the uh, material, we also have two forces working, external and internal. In other words, the material, there are causes that I'm not relating to the unseen world, but I'm relating to the, the seen world, but there are, ex there are signs and there are also symptoms. And the symptoms we do not know unless they are, they are articulated by the very people that are involved in the matter. So we do not know. Now, in looking at the material, we have two important things to look at. One is kufr itself. And the Prophet ﷺ has said, Al-Kufr millatun wahida. Kufr is one system. It is one milla. All of kufr is one milla. You have the, the Marxists, the atheists, the communists, the uh, socialists, the national socialists, international socialists, the capitalists, the free market capitalists, the, uh, the American anti-NAFTA, anti-GATS capitalists, all different types of capitalists, ultimately one phenomenon called Kufa. It's all Kufa. It goes under the rubric of Kufa, but it has different permutations. And you can see syphilis, very interesting disease. One of the doyens of medicine in the 19th century said, no syphilis in all of its manifestations and you've mastered 80% of pathology. Because syphilis is called the great mimicker. And the syphilis can look like a lot of different diseases. And this is a syphilitic culture, right? Really, they had syphilis, they all, you know why they wear wigs, right? You see all these pictures of the men in wigs. And we're, you know, what cultures had men wearing wigs? Their hair was all falling out. They had syphilis. Really, that's what happened. They, and then the scrofulas. You said they had syphilitic scrofulas, so they started wearing these high collars. Very uncomfortable to hide the syphilis. It was a very common disease in, in Europe. I'm not exaggerating this. It still is. It's just all gone underground in this culture. They call it AIDS now. Right? I mean, AIDS is, it's, if you look at AIDS and study AIDS, it looks exactly like syphilis in fast motion. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, a physician will confirm that for me. They, AIDS, dementia, the first thing, they break out in rashes. Right? And then they, later on, they go into his, uh, dementia, which is tertiary syphilis. And interesting to note that that community that AIDS began first showing up in, the first signs of it, homosexual community, was uh, a community constantly exposed to syphilis and, and rectal gonorrhea. So in fact, you can see the statistics of the public health uh, in, in the Bay Area. It's very, very uh, disgusting. It's all part of their culture. So you have the point I'm using about syphilis as a grotesque example, but Syphilis mimics a lot of different things. It can look very different. It's still syphilis. 
And the same is true with what Nietzsche calls syphilization, right? It looks very different, but ultimately it's Kufa. So the Eastern Bloc looks different from the Western Bloc. It's still Kufa. Now, if we study Kufa, and it's an important study because Allah spends a good deal, uh, tells us, not stuff that Allah does not spend, but tells us in the Quran, much of the Quran is in explaining Kufar so that we can understand it. Now, if you look at Kufar, the European Kufar is very different from other Kufars in that the Europeans have a deep agitation for centuries. And that agitation, Allah Ta'ala, relates to the fact that they had partial truths mixed with a lot of pseudo uh, truth, things that appear to be true. Their religion was tainted from very early on. Their books were altered from very early on. Now, if you look at the Christian text, the very first Christians were called Nazarenes by their own testimony. They're called, according to the Quran, Nasara. Now, they're finally realizing and they actually realized all this in the 19th century, but now they're starting to sell it, books about it in places like Barnes & Noble after nobody can read, right? <laughs> See, they, that's, now they can just, you can go get all the information about what they're doing, about their kufr, everything. You can go get it now because nobody's going to read it because they're all watching TV. So it works. They can tell us the whole story. If you look at a, a book that Hans Kuhn did, in, uh, called Christianity in the World Religion. Kunz writes, Admittingly, current research would indicate that any direct dependency of Islam upon Jewish Christianity, and you see they're admitting there was something called Jewish Christianity, and that was the first Christianity, of whatever sort, because there were various types even early on, will continue to be disputed for a while. In other words, we're trying to find the direct dependency. So it's in dispute right now because they have absolutely not one shred of evidence. But they do not, and I'll get to the reason why he has to say this, because it's a very important point he's making. We simply know too little about the Arabian Peninsula in those centuries before the Prophet Muhammad. That's rubbish. It is not true. But the analogies are as astonishing as ever. In other words, between Islam and original Christianity because we believe that it was Islam. This is what he's telling us. And this is very important because this man is one of the dominant uh, theologians of this age uh, for the Christians, even though he's basically excommunicated by the Catholic Church because he's just telling the truth and the truth destroys the foundations of the Catholic Church. It's a big problem. Even if we could never scientifically verify a genetic connection, the traditional historical parallels are escapable. What does he mean by a genetic connection? A materialistic connection. We don't believe it's revelation. Christian again, shame on you. You're supposed to believe in revelation. But he can't because he'll have to become Muslim. So we have to find a genetic material link. And how can we explain why Muhammad, وسلم, although he rejected orthodox Christology, Nonetheless, always spoke sympathetically of Jesus as the great messenger, indeed as the Messiah who brought the gospel. In his theology and history of Jewish Christianity, Hans Joachim Schobes, taking up the research of Harnack and Schlattler and completing it with the studies by Clemen and Adre and Shader, comes to the following broadly substantiated conclusion, quote, Though it may not be possible to establish exact proof of the connection, the indirect dependence, what, and they mean by indirect is we don't have any evidence. The indirect dependence of Muhammad وسلم, on sectarian Jewish Christianity is beyond any doubt. In other words, we can see it very clear that the Quran is articulating the Christianity that our own historical research is coming to realize was the original Christianity. And that is the Christianity that the Quran is saying is the Christianity that the Muslims believe in. This leaves us with a paradox of truly world historical dimensions. And when Kuffar used the word paradox, it means we can't explain it materialistically. 
the fact that while Jewish Christianity, Christianity in the church came to grief, in other words, it disappears, it was preserved in Islam and with some regard to its and with regard to some of its driving impulse, at least it has lasted till our own time. End quote. Hans Kuhn, Christianity and World Religions, Double Day, New York, 1985, page 124. For anybody who could write that fast. So there you have it. The, Christ, the Christians have done their own research. They did it in the 19th century. They realized that their religion was a false religion. But there was an original Christianity. They called the original gospel Q. It's what the Germans entitled it, which in the Quran is called Injil. See, we know what it was called. They call it Q to mean the original, the quell, the source gospel. We know that it's the Injil. Now, they can no longer believe in the Christianity that they have if they're intellectuals. The people that believe in it are Methodists, Baptists, uh, Pentecostals, uh, and a whole generic uh, other group of generic, what they call fundamentalists, right? Who are people that will only read the Bible uh, because they say this is all the devil's handicraft. And it's very interesting that our scholars are, dem we have to, by obligation in Islam, read uh, the uh, Kufa. The scholars, there's a Farb Kifaya, which is Raddu Shubuhat, which necessitates that our scholars look at what they are saying against Islam and refute it and show that it's false. They can't do this. They can't refute any of this historical research. They say it's the devil. <laughs> and they're all devils just pointing fingers at each other in the end of the day. But, I mean, that's what they do. So the Christians have this problem and it lasts for centuries and they, they split. And what really the split, interestingly enough, as most of us already know, comes with the fall of Spain, with the introduction of the rational sciences into Christianity. People like Roger Bacon. Roger Bacon was uh, teaching in England in a robe and turban. He spoke Arabic. He was accused of being an infidel. He, he was a monk had heavy influence. He said we have to learn from the Arabs. Um, and then you have Albertus Magnus reintroducing uh, Aristotelian uh, teachings into the church through the commentaries of Ibn Rushd of Arawis, which now somebody showed me on the way over the Life magazine, putting Ibn Rushd up there as one of the most important characters of the last 2,000 years because they're recognizing it now. And they've translated all his books now, Butterworth and these people at, at Princeton, I think. They know. They're finally admitting it. That stuff was in Latin for centuries, and now they're admitting that this man had a massive impact. Now, Ibn Rushd, rahimahullah, who was a scholar of extraordinary depth and profundity nonetheless, he was, he, he was basically, if we look at his fiqh writings, which are Maliki and are actually considerable, and, and they're, they're substantiated writings. In other words, the Maliki scholars use him as a source. But his philosophical writings are rationalist. And he was attempting to join rationalism with uh, revelation, which is very, very difficult. And if anybody did it, the Muslims came close. But there's still massive problems and gaps uh, that, that will continue to be there. That what happened is, is that they began to read these people. Ibn Rushd is one of them, Ibn Sina is another, Al-Ghazali. And you can look at the, the Arab influence of European civilization. It's better to use Muslim, but they always use Arab. Many of them were Persians. And you can see passages side by side that are absolutely identical between, uh, you look at Imam Al-Ghazali's writings and then St. Thomas Aquinas, put them side by side. He was well before St. Thomas Aquinas. It's almost a direct translation. And they were not quoting their sources. So this happened. They had massive influence by the Muslims. What that did, when they took the intellectual scholastic teachings of Islam, removed from the pure revelatory source that maintained those teachings within a framework, not a framework, really it is reality itself. And so the Muslims did not go astray because of that. They abandon the true understanding of the world, which is through Tawheed, 
And they took this teaching, which was the intellectual and rational sciences of the Muslims, and it began to go diametrically in opposition to their own religion. In the end, they chose to abandon their religion. This is what they did. They abandoned their religion. And this is the crisis of the modern world. When they abandoned their religion, and Nietzsche is the one, he declared it. God is dead, you killed him. In other words, the God that we used to believe in, this Trinitarian mystery, is it's a fairy tale. We, we don't buy it anymore. We know its sources. We know the pagan sources of it. We studied it. He was a philologist. It's over. Because of that, it's only now that they are beginning to reap the bitter fruits of their abandonment of their religion because the center doesn't hold in this society anymore. And this is where you've got the leveling, their nihilistic tendencies. It has become a, a world of the most base uh, aspects of the human creature. The bestial nature is exalted. The angelic nature is denied. It is denied completely. Greed is good, get what you can, stab them in the back before they stab you in the back. There's a book, bestseller in America, Learning to Swim with Sharks, right? In other words, How to Become a Shark. That's the real title that he doesn't want to say, right? Because only sharks swim with sharks, right? In other words, learn how to be as ruthless as the next guy. And in a wage slave society in which jobs are completely expendable and you're given, everybody's worried about their job. And they don't care about the next guy because they know that the boss doesn't care about him. So he's got to do what he can to get ahead, to stay ahead. And this is what it does. Make myself as marketable as possible. Increase my skills. Bulk up my CV. Get it honed down. Get it refined. And this is the game that's played constantly. Right? This is the game of this culture, and it's just a type of kufa, right? marketing yourself. The, commodity, the, the, the human being is commodity. Now, what happens in, 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 uh, is that you can't just phase out religion. You see, you can't just get rid of religion. It's too deep. It has roots that are very powerful. So what did these people do? The first thing they did is they moved from from what they call theism to deism. In other words, an imminent God that actually has miracles, impacts his creation, sends prophets. We have to move that God out of the way. I mean, that's horrific language, but this is really how they looked at it. And we'll replace him with another God, a distant deistic God, and who's a God of natural laws. And this is the Enlightenment period, where they begin to talk about these laws, and there's no miracles. And this is David Hume, the great, he's the big Kafir of, of England. He's, he's one of the big Abalisa of this whole story. And he also borrowed heavily from the Muslims, interestingly enough, and again, removing it from its uh, revelatory source. So, because he makes many, many very valid points. But he basically says, you cannot know things through human understanding. It's limited. All you can know is the world, but you can't know anything metaphysical. Everything that we explain must be explained through material causes. Well, the man who takes this up is Darwin. Darwin reads Hume, and Darwin realizes, how do we explain the origin of man if we remove God? Because every people's before that has a supernatural explanation, something outside of nature. Whether it's a multi-god uh, story, some creational myth, there's always a supernatural element. This didn't just appear out of nowhere. Well, Darwin says, how do I explain the origin of species without bringing God into it? And he thinks deeply about this. He was a very clever guy. And he comes up, after reading Malthus, with natural selection and uh, goes into this whole idea of random chance. And I guarantee you, evolution is complete kofar. And if you believe in evolution, you have been duped and fooled. Really, duped and fooled. We do not believe in evolution. 
Absolutely not. And if you understand it, as the biologists do, and you still say that you believe in it, really it's like a hukum of ridda, because Allah does not, there's no chance in Allah's creation. Right? There's no random chance happening. You know, there, there's not mistakes made over and over again until it suddenly gets it right. Right? And then that gene is transmitted. And really, it's against the teaching of Islam. Which does not mean there's not microevolution and things, but the macroevolution is a story, it's a narrative. It is a narrative that explains the origin of man without any recourse to the divine. That's all it is. And if you believe it, you have to recognize the religious nature of the belief in that narrative. And again, you are, it's taqlid, it's just blind imitation of, because most people are not biologists. Most people have not studied it. They're just taking for granted, oh, it must be true because he got a PhD from Harvard. <laughs> really, Harvard is like Al-Bukhari used to be with the Muslims. Right? That's what they used to say. It's in Sahih Al-Bukhari. Now they say, I heard it from a doctor from Harvard. And read what's going on in evolution. Read Darwin's Black Box. Right, the collapse of Darwinism, not from Christians. I don't read that stuff. The Christian creation science, spare me. You know, Earth was created 7,000 years ago on September 21st, you know. No thanks. But don't, don't just catch on to the latest fad. And it's not late anymore. I mean, there's been neo-Darwinism. You know, they've gone on. They're not Darwinists, pure Darwinists anymore. They had to restructure the whole thing in the 1940s because there were so many holes in it. And then the 1950s, with the explosion of electron microscopy, they had to. Comp they haven't dealt with the information they've got. This is what Behe's book, Darwin's Black Box. He's a he's a, a microbiologist who's saying we've got some major holes here, and Darwinism doesn't answer them. Because the cell is not a simple organism. It is incredibly complex. There's more information in a unicellular bacteria than there are in all the libraries in uh, New York City. And Darwin thought it was just empty protoplasmic uh, nothingness down there if you got down deep enough. And, and we don't even know what's beyond that because we're limited. I mean, what if they discover another thing beyond that? We don't know if there's something underlying there. Really, we don't. It's all in yatibi'un illa dhan. They follow conjecture. And their scientific theories are the latest uh, and most uh, explanatory to them to, to, to whatever they're looking at. So, what happens then in the Muslim world? Well, I want just to bring another fellow, very important. And I would recommend Muslims reading this book which is by David Franken, Peace to End All Peace. Because what happens basically is the Europeans desired the Muslim world for several reasons. But they really wanted the Muslim world. They wanted the wealth that was there, and they also wanted to basically destroy a continuing threat to them, which was Ottoman power. Because we forget that the Ottomans themselves were, were continuing their uh, movements in uh, the invasion of Europe, or what we would say the Futuhat, really liberation of Europe. Uh, and so the Europeans were very frightened of them. But as the Ottomans began to uh, diminish, become less and less uh, powerful, and they obviously saw, and this is the tragedy of it, the Ottomans saw the waning of the Muslim powers and the waxing of the European powers. And what the Ottomans did at that point is that they began to bring, bring European advisors in. And the Tanzimat of the 1840s is already a radical departure from uh, the Islamic tradition. This is already happening within the Ottoman state, you see. And the Germans are being brought in, money is being borrowed, by the time uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid, great uh, Muslim ruler, uh, enters into power, he is literally powerless to change the massive 
destruction that had been done before him. And this is a good sign of a just ruler who can come into power, but because there's so much corruptive uh, or corrosion at every other level, he's unable as an individual to do what it takes to complete the task at hand, which is to renew the Islamic tradition. The same is true in Morocco with Muli Abd uh, Hafil, who was a great uh, Islamic ruler at the turn of this century. He's deposed by the French. He was a scholar, he was a lover of knowledge, and he, uh, and he was attempting to revivify the Islamic tradition within Morocco and to uh, protect Morocco from the incursions of the Europeans, but he also failed. Now, what the Europeans call this is the great game. They call, this is what they called it. They called it the great game, playing with the Muslims. And it's still going on. The game is still going on. And it's actually quite frightening because what happens is, is what I'm becoming to realize now, is that all of the so-called liberation movements of the 1950s that were centered out of uh, Egypt, you know, were in fact nothing other than the power plays of the Americans at removing the Europeans from uh, their colonial influence in those lands. The Americans were directing those movements, and this evidence, I'm telling you, it's there. You can find it if you do the research. They were directing these movements. They were undermining uh, the European power, and they were moving in for this Pax Americana, the, uh, the American... Uh, century, right, post-World War II. So many noble people fought from the Muslims with the best of intentions. Many of them died, and inshallah, Allah give them Jannah. But the truth of the matter is, our countries, after all of that uh, bloodshed and all of that suffering of the Algerian people, the, the land of a million martyrs, look at the state of Algeria now. Really, look at the state of Algeria now. A million martyrs fought late 50s into 1962 were killed at freeing the French. And for what? For Bambala and Boumedian, uh, people that betrayed uh, the people that, that shed their blood uh, for that land. And Bambala then becomes a, you know, he's, he's like a, you know, he's saying now Islam is the only solution. It's what Sheikh Hisham al Burhani, I was once in a gathering in, in the Emirates and there was an ex-Syrian president there from the early 60s. can't remember his name. And uh, he was saying how Islam is the only answer. And Sheikh Hisham al-Burhani said to him, why is it that you people never realize that when you're in power? And then when you lose your power, you know, suddenly it becomes obvious. It's a very good question. Now, if you, if you look at this book, it's very amazing. It really is extraordinary what that they were doing here. Right? Lord Kitchener. Kitchener sets out to capture Islam. Kitchener and his colleagues believed that Islam could be bought, manipulated, or captured by buying, manipulating, or capturing its religious leadership. And they did it. Seriously. They did it. There's Azhari Shiyu that were in the same Freemasonic Lodge as Lord Cromer in Egypt. It's historical fact. They're all declassified documentation. You can see their own handwritings, their own signatures. In fact, you get this blue, you know, the Freemasonic, in the French Revolution, the Freemasonic colors were red, blue, and white. Uh, egality, liberty, egality, and brotherhood, right? A load of nonsense. Freemasonic rubbish, right? And so you get the Azharis suddenly showing up with red and blue instead of black tassels. I'm not making this up. Blue instead of black tassels on their turbans. Where'd that come from? Red, blue, and white. Right there, the French flag up on his head. Now it's the American flag. He just needs some stars up there, right? <laughs> SubhanAllah. It's very sad. They were intrigued by the notion that whoever controlled the Khalif controlled Islam. And it was Kitchener actually did not want to 
split Islam up into several different uh, countries. He wanted to control the, uh, the Khalifa. And just he said, it's better if we got the leadership, we can control the whole thing at one time. The other uh, British divide and conquer. It's a better policy. We can make a lot of money selling them weapons while they kill each other. Right. So for Kitchener and his entourage, the possibilities of a Muslim jihad against Britain was a recurring nightmare. Right. So they set out to undermine it. Now, what they did is they created nationalism. Right. Now, I just want to read Frumpkin here very briefly. But it's very interesting what he says. Often referred to as nationalists, these men are more accurately described as separatists. They did not ask for independence. They asked for a greater measure of participation and local rule. They were willing to be ruled largely by Turks because the Turks were fellow Muslims. He's talking about Egyptian and Syrian and Lebanese uh, people at that time. They were not nationalists. Unlike European nationalists, they were people whose beliefs existed in a religious rather than a secular framework. They lived within the walls of the city of Islam in a sense in which Europe had not lived within Christendom since the early Middle Ages. For like the cities built in the Arab world in medieval times, the lives of the Muslim circles centered around a central mosque. They did not represent an ethnic group, for historically the only ethnic or true Arabs, in quotation, were the inhabitants of Arabia, while the Arabic-speaking populations of such provinces as Baghdad and Damascus and other places were mixed ethnic stock. Right? Anyway, the book goes on. Right? Now just look what Wiseman, founder of Zionism, right? one of the founders of Zionism, says was introduced to Prince Faisal. Not the one that was killed, but the one that was working with Lawrence and these people. And was enthusiastic about him. A Zionist, enthusiastic about a Muslim. That's a bad sign. Right. Wiseman wrote to his wife that, quote, He is the first real Arab nationalist I have met. So this is an indication that it did not exist in the Muslim framework only a less than a hundred years ago. It didn't exist. Because he's saying he's the first real Arab nationalist that I met. He is a leader. Exclamation mark. He's quite intelligent. Quite. Can't be very intelligent, right? If he's an Arab and a nationalist, right? right? And a very honest man. Handsome as a picture. He is not interested in Palestine like Sultan Abdul Hamid. But on the other hand, he wants Damascus and the whole northern Syria. He is contemptuous of the Palestinian Arabs, who he doesn't even regard as Arabs. The Prophet said, my ummah would be destroyed by little children from the tribe of Quraysh. That the ummah would be destroyed by little children, Ghulamiya, like little children, little boys from the tribe of Quraysh. So it goes on, the, the big game, right? They, they dismantle coup d'etat, Sultan Abdul Hamid, dismantle the thing, and then what we're, Islam is redacted, and people don't realize this. That a whole new version of Islam is written, and it begins emphasizing things like, Hubb al Watan min al Iman, love of nation is from Iman, which is a saying that refers to Akhira primarily, right? Because the famous uh, uh, poet, Poetry that Imam Nawawi has in the introduction to his uh, in his introduction uh, to the Riyadh al-Salihin is that the people who realize the dunya was not their watan, right? They realize that the dunya was not their watan, so they divorce the dunya. Right? So nationalism becomes: I'm an Egyptian, you're a Syrian, he's a Lebanese, you're a Pakistani, he's a Turk. And this is the separation, divide and conquer. We no longer see ourselves within the fold of Islam, the brotherhood that Allah has given us. In the men we know ikhwa. The believers are brothers. We now see ourselves, I'm a, an American Muslim, he's a Pakistani Muslim, he's a Indian Muslim, he's a Bengali Muslim, and on and on and on. False designations that Islam rejects completely. And you can go on and on. I mean, the story goes on. It just gets worse. So what I'd rather do is look quickly at our present and then... When I mention about envy, 
The disease of envy is a very uh, important disease to understand because the, the Muslims have become deeply envious of the West. And you can see it in that original quote that I used about envy, that it's a secret admiration. Envy is a secret admiration. You want to be like them. But you know your happiness is not going to be in admiring them, so you become contemptuous of them. So we have rhetoric from Indonesia to Morocco about the West and how terrible the West is. Everybody dresses like them. They eat like them. They want to study in their universities. They want their green cards to America and Canada, right? And one of the muftis in, uh, in Palestine, Jazallah Khairan, gave a fatwa that anyone who sells land in Palestine, in Quds, to Jews is a murtad. Because the Jews were offering them $100,000 Canadian citizenship. Right? Who runs Canada? to sell land because they'll just buy them out right and then they'll say look we've got it's all deeded to us we bought it from them they sold it anyone in Palestine now if they're just sitting in their house really just sitting in their house is a murada really just sitting in the house is an act of jihad in that place Now, if you look at this disease of envy, because everybody's watching their television, satellite dishes everywhere. They're cropping up all over the Muslim world, every rooftop. Look at Damascus. Somebody was telling me that the minarets are pointing up straight to the heavens, and all of the satellites are pointing to Europe. Right? And it's like you have two choices. Wahi, right, from Allah, or wahi from shaitan. Because shaitan has a wahi. Right? Yuhi. Shaitan has a wahi because he tries to mimic God. Just like Allah said his throne is on water. Where does shaitan put his throne? On water. You see? So they bring in these uh, unseen influences. Shaitanic influences. And I'm not making that up. It's not an exaggeration. Television, you don't know what's going into your brain there. But they're all watching it. I mean, I just came from the Muslim world not that long ago. They're all in their houses. I went to visit people. You can't even have a conversation because the TV's on and you're trying to talk and they're like this. <laughs> and then every once in a while they'll kind of come back. Right? No, this, I'm not making this up. It's unbelievable. We have to throw that machine out as Muslims. Really, give it up. It's a drug. It's a drug. That's all it is. It's like any drug. You kick the habit. You start feeling good. <sighs> Getting that out of my system. And unfortunately, the images come back and things like that. Right? Really, they're all imprinted in there. You can watch movies. You don't have to go buy new ones, go out and get the video. You can just play reruns in your mind if you have a good memory. <laughs> so look here present condition, right? Envy. Now, about Qarun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Qarun. He says that he was from the people of Musa alayhi salam. In the tafsir they say he was his cousin. Some say the uncle, some say Ibn Am. Most of them say the cousin. He acted insolently towards them. Baga alayhim. He became proud. Why? Because he'd been given him wealth. Who gave him the wealth? Allah atayinahu min al kunuzi. We gave him min al kunuzi. Tabayyub. It's a partitive. We gave him some of the treasures that exist. So much so that the keys of those treasures would be a burden to a group of strong men just carrying the keys. A wealthy man. Bill Gates, modern Harun. Ul al And he said to his people, his people said to him, La tafrah. Don't, don't rejoice because you have dunya. Because Allah doesn't love the farihin, the people who rejoice with dunya. فَبِذَارِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُوا with the, the huda of Allah, with the fadl and the rahmah of Allah, the Quran and the messenger of Allah. That's what you should rejoice in. 
It's better than what they're gathering. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ, when the Ansar were being affected because he was giving the Quraysh new Muslims, Ta'lif al Qulub, he was giving them all the, the dunya that they'd gotten, the booty. And the Ansar began to feel like he's neglecting us. And, the, and one of them mentioned that to the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet gathered them and he said, Aren't you content that they get the booty and you get me? Because he went back, he left Mecca, he went back to Medina with them. They were happy with that. When they heard that, they all rejoiced. Because they were believers, not deluded by dunya. Now, and then Allah says, Ibtaghi fi ma'ataka Allah. And this is the beauty of Quran. You can't translate these things. Because the same word bagha alayhim now is used, ibtaghi. Right? But now it's used in a mutawak form. It's a reflexive. Do this for yourself. Use what Allah has given you for the dar al-akhirah. Don't do it for dunya. Do it for akhirah. Don't forget your portion of the dunya. The mufassirun say, the kafan is your portion of the dunya. That's what you take with you. That's your portion. What you take is your kafan. What you're wrapped in your funeral shroud. That's the portion of dunya you take with you when you die. Don't forget that. Desire, and there's other interpretations that it means that it's permissible to enjoy the mubahat, right? but not to go to excess in them. But most of the early ones prefer that one that it's, use it for akhirah. And then he says, وَأَحْسَنْ كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكَ Show ihsan just as Allah has shown ihsan to you. And then, وَلَا تَبْغِي الْفَسَادِ Again, bagha. Don't desire corruption in the earth because Allah does not love those who sow corruption. So here's Qarun, a man from Bani Israel. Bani Israel were the Muslims of that time, let us not forget. And here's a man who, because of wealth that was given to him, he becomes oppressive. And we can see many examples of that in the Muslim world now. The Muslim world has some of the greatest wealth now, right? They do. Massively wealthy. And we have many, many Qaruns now in the Muslim world. Many of them. On and on. But he's being told. Now, what does they say? What do they say? Then he says, قَالَ إِنَّمَا أُتِيتُهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عِنْدِي No, this wealth is from me. I have a knowledge. I have a, a PhD from Harvard. That's how I got this wealth. I'm more clever than you are. Right? Really, I invented this machine and I got the patent. That's how I got it. Allah didn't give me this. That's what they think. Doesn't he know that Allah has destroyed those before him from other generations? They have more power than him and they had more wealth. But the, he will not be asked. The, the, the Mujirimun of this age won't be asked about the wrong actions of the previous people. So when he came out to his people, خَرَجْ عَلَى قَوْمِهِ فِي زِينَتِهِ He came out all embellished. And those, قَالَ الَّذِينَ يُرِيدُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا Those who want the life of this world, what did they say? Oh, that we had what Qarun had. See, this is the disease. This is the disease. They want what others have. The Muslims want what America has. They want what Europe has. They want it. Why can't we have everybody have a car? Why can't we all have refrigerators too? Right? Really? Why can't we have all this dunya like they have? Now, look what Allah says after that. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ Those who had knowledge, what do they say? وَيْلَكُمْ وَهُوَ وَهُوَ أَنْتِ يُو ثَوَابَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ لِمَنْ آمَنَ وَعْمِلَ صَارِحًا The reward of Allah is better for the one who believes and does righteous deeds. وَلَا يُرَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الصَّابِرُونَ Now here's the key here, sabr. Because there's two conflicts. The conflict of the human who's been given things which is either to show ingratitude or to show gratitude. And the conflict of the human being who has been deprived of things. And this is either to be patient or to become envious. This is the choice. You either become patient and recognize this is Allah doing this. Don't think, you see, when people look at the, the Europeans now and the Americans, 
they say, look, they're not following Islam and they have all this, it's all working for them, which it's not. But this is the way a lot of superficial people look at it. It's all, why is it that they're in control of us? Look at us, we're all backward, this and that, etc., etc. These people have nothing. They are a whip that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using to beat the disobedient servants. They are our discipline. That's all they are. They're disciplined to the Muslims. They're disciplining us until we learn the lesson. And they'll keep disciplining us until we turn away. Until we lose our sadistic tendencies of envying what we can't have and desiring the Dar al-Akhirah, giving up our love of dunya, returning to jihad, returning to mujahada of the self, working on getting rid of the diseases of the heart, not on increasing them. So those people were warned. Now what happens? فَخَسَفْنَا بِهِ وَبِدَارِهِ الْأَرْضِ Allah caused the earth to swallow him up and his abode. And in the tafsir, they say that Musa was given permission to destroy him. And he made a dua and the earth took him a third of his body and one, two other people that were with him that went with him instead of going with Musa because they wanted his dunya. And the other ones decided to go because he, Billah, he accused Musa and, and of, uh, of some things that were false. And the woman that was used to accuse him admitted that she was paid by Qarun to do that. And Qarun called on Musa, Astaghatha bi Musa, Musa help me. He made dua and he was thrust again. A third time he was destroyed. And Allah revealed to Musa, Musa. Had he called on me, I would have had mercy. But he called on you. Musa kana shadidan. Right? The Prophet ﷺ said, Omar was like Musa. And Abu Bakr was like Ibrahim ﷺ. So when they saw that after, he was unable to be helped. أَصْبَحَ الَّذِينَ تَمَنَّوا مَكَانَهُ بِالْأَمْسِ يَقُولُونَ وَيْكَ أَنَّ اللَّهِ يَبْسُطُ الرِّزْقَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ So those people, when they realized, they were desiring yesterday, they wanted to be like Qarun. The next day they saw what happened to them and they say, we're lucky we're not like him. You see now, the Muslims want what the Americans have. They're getting it. And they're getting the corruption of the television, the destruction of the families. It's all happening. Now not only do they have social corruption, corruption within the house itself. Losing the women. Really. I mean, just look, look around us, look what's happening to the Muslim youth, right? I mean, this is quite hopeful, there's a lot of good uh, youth here, but how many for every one person in here, and I'm not saying just because, alhamdulillah, I mean, any going to the masjid, any Islamic function, anything, but for one person in here, how many Muslims are out in Toronto, right? Wasting their lives away, wishing they had what Harun has. And after that, Allah says, This is the house of the Akhirah that we give for those who do not desire to be exalted in the earth. The Muslims, we do not desire to be exalted. We should not desire to be prancing around like the Americans. We want that the kalima of Allah is exalted, not the Muslims. When the Prophet ﷺ came into Mecca, he came in in a state of humbleness. His head was lowered. He came in with his head bowed down. If you look at the way tyrants come into their cities when they conquer them, they come in with drums. Montgomery, you know this guy, Montgomery, the British general. He used to come in with bands and drums when they defeat. This is the way he came in. Right? Clapping his... Uh, all of them, they were all arrogant. Arrogant people. Mustakbirun. The Prophet ﷺ came in with humility because he saw where the victory was coming from. It wasn't from him, it was from the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Nasr is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So this is the disease. Of, it's, a, it's a vicious one. And it's interesting that Allah, one of the, the second to the last surah of Quran, وَحَاسِدٍ إِذَا hasad. The envier when he envies. Now, just 
the present state, looking at the present, I think that sums it up. There's an, a few other things. You can look at the fact that even though we condemn the West for all of its degradation and its depravity and this and that, look at our own lands. Look at the Muslim uh, condition today. Look at it. Reflect on it. I mean, they had a, uh, they had a study done here in the West in which they said that the, the most corrupt country in the world was Nigeria. And the second most corrupt was Pakistan. Right? And then somebody said, in fact, Pakistan won, but they bribed Nigeria to take the, the first prize. <laughs> Now, Nigeria, Pakistan, and all the rest, the Muslim countries, these countries are corrupt also. But like I was taught from a physician friend of mine who taught me uh, how to uh, analyze patients, said never examine a patient under artificial light. So when you look at the West, you're looking under artificial light. The Muslims, it's natural light, so they look as bad as they are. Up here, it's artificial light, so they might look a little perkier than they actually are, but they're in bad shape, and they're corrupt. Their corruption is deep. But I will say that my own experience in, uh, in the West has been that generally in certain aspects, at the individual level, you will find... Uh, and Allah says this in the Quran. There's from people from the book of from the people of the book, if you give them a lot of wealth, they'll they'll give it back to you. So Allah says from them are good and from them are bad. But generally uh, the level of corruption has not permeated to the extent that it has in the Muslim lands. And that's a very serious indictment of the Muslims. Because our experience, most of us who've traveled in the Muslim world, we experience this, and it's quite devastating. So I'll end this by hope for the future, because we're hopeful. And we all have to be, because we're Muslim. And the hadith that diagnoses our disease which is also, once the disease is diagnosed, is an indication of what the cure is. And, and the cure is also mentioned in another hadith. The hadith is related by Abu Naim, and it's from Mu'ad radiallahu anhu. And there are many versions of it, but this one is, is interesting. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is reported to have said, أَنْتُمْ مَدْيَوْمَ عَرَبِيِّنَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنَ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ تَظْهَرُ فِيكُمْ السَّكَرَتَانِ You today are on clear proof from your Lord. You command to good and you forbid evil. And you struggle in the way of Allah. تُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ And then there will manifest in you these two very serious symptoms of impending doom. Sakaratul Jahal, ignorance, was Sakarat Hub al Aish, and the disease of love, of livelihood, of dunya. Wasatu Hawaluna and Darika Fadata Muruna di Marufin, Wadatan Hona and Munkaran, Wadatu Jahiduna Fidlahi, El Kaimu Yoma Idin, Bid Kitabi, was Sunnati, Lahu Ajuru Hamsina Sudika. قالوا يا رسول الله منا أو منهم قال لا بل منكم وأخرج الأحمد والبزار وأبو نعيم الحاكم بسند صحيح يوشك أن يملأ الله أيديكم من العجم ويجعلهم أسدا لا يفرون فيقتلون مقاتركم ويأكلون فيأكم You will soon be taken over by the, the, the عجم and they will be like lions that don't flee from you and they will fight the way you fight and they'll eat from your booty. And this is also an indication of the force who became Muslim and the other Muslims, because he was speaking primarily to the Arab contingency. Um, but there's another hadith, which is that, يُشِكُ أَنْ تَدَعَ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أُمَمْ 
من كل أفق كما تداعى الأكرة إلى قصعتها قيل يا رسول الله فمن قلة منا يومئذ قال لا ولكنكم غثاء كغثاء السيل يجعل الوهن في قلوبكم ويجعل الوهن في قلوبكم وينزع الرعب من قلوب عدوكم لحبكم الدنيا وكراهيتكم الموت that it's coming a time when the Jews and the Christians as interpreted in the other hadith will come from every ufaq from every horizon and they will eat from you from your plate like eaters eat from a plate and they said Ya Rasulullah is it from that we're few in numbers they said no but you're like scum the foam on the top of the flow and there's a weakness in your hearts and fear is taken out of the hearts of your enemies and the reason for this لِحُبِّكُمْ الدُّنْيَا وَكَرَهِيَتِكُمْ الْمَوْتِ because you love dunya and you, you hate death very simple diagnosis which means that the cure then are two things one is the jahl has to be removed and every single Islamic renaissance if you study the history of Islam began with intellectual renaissance and you show me one that did not because the very first Islam began with Darul Arqam it began in Mecca in a house with one man sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaching men and women Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and removing from their hearts love of dunya and Umar radiallahu anhu said to the Persians we will send an army the love of death with them is just is greater than your love of life and this comes from knowledge because the more knowledge one gains and we're not talking about ma'lumat, information there's orientalists that learn all the rules that's not real knowledge there are orientalists that know Islam they can lecture about Islam they can tell you everything they can give you the aqidah of the Muslims they can tell all these things but in the end they do not believe so it is not real knowledge real knowledge is of two types one is a knowledge in which one is limited in their intellectual understandings but the knowledge penetrates their heart this is Ibn Rajab al-Hambari and the second is where they join the two they have the outward and the inward as well and these are the people that are the leaders the hujja of Allah in his land and the third type is somebody who knows the outward but it doesn't penetrate the inward and that's called a hypocrite and they're the ones that the Prophet ﷺ feared more than anybody and finally the last thing that I'll uh, leave you with is, I think, a very powerful statement by an American who's talking about the disease of the autonomy of man. Solzhenitsyn, uh, the Russian, said that the modern Western mindset can be understood as humanistic autonomy. Istighna. Man transgresses in that he deems himself independent of Allah. And these people now deem themselves independent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, according to this man, Sultan Yitzin says, is an autonomy of man from any higher force above him. Commenting on this, if superior forces are not allowed, current epistemology has no way to register them. I have argued then, human life has no alternative but to appear autonomous. In other words, if we deny the material, the spiritual influences in our lives, because they only look at the outward, and we look, when we look at and analyze things, we keep in mind vahir and batin. Huwal awwalu wal akhiru wal vahir wal batin. We keep in mind both aspects, the outwardly manifest and the inwardly hidden. They are only looking at the outward, they do not see the inward. And so, because of that, there's no alternative but to appear autonomous. The human being is autonomous. There's nothing behind all of this. If we were surprised to find Sultan Yitzhak blaming his pres this presumed autonomy for the fact that the Western world has lost its civic courage, a fact which cannot be disputed is the weakening of human personality in the West. Look at, seriously, look at uh, the, the people that are being produced in these cultures. He tells us it is because mechanists we have largely and unconsciously become. We assume that if superior forces exist, they would tyrannize. We take their absence to be liberating. So we deny that there's anything superior to us, and we see that if there was, it would only be a tyranny over us. It would be a tyranny over This is very important. It would be a tyranny over us. 
it seems not to occur to us that such forces might empower us and liberate us. Submission in Arabic Islam was the very name of the religion that surfaced through the Qur'an. Yet its entry into history occasioned the greatest political explosion the world has known. That's the outward he's looking at. Where did the, the, the power and the impetus of that political explosion, where did it come from? The unseen forces. If mention of this fact automatically triggers our fears of fanaticism, says the Western reader, Islam exploded onto the world. Those were those crazy Saracens, the fanatics. Here's what he says. This simply shows us another defense our agnostic reflexes has erected against the possibility of there being something that better than we are in every respect could infuse us with goodness as well as power were we open to the transfusion. See, what he's saying is, is that if you look at Islam and what it brought and the civilization that it created and the dignity of man that it established, the educations, the traditions, the institutes, the, the artifacts of their, the remnants of those cultures are sold for massive amounts of money because these people, the rich people in this culture want to have them ornamenting their houses. Right? You see, this is, this is, Islam is powerful. It's transformative. It is transformative and it can transform every single one of us if we're open to it. At the individual level, all of us have to make an absolute commitment to studying our deen, to studying it in, in, its, in, in its most uh, comprehensive and broad-based orthopraxic tradition. In other words, the parameters are broad within limits. We don't go outside of those limits. But the Muslims traditionally have had differing views, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed that, given us different ways to, to practice our faith and to understand it within generous guidelines of our messenger. So inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, make us people of this deen and, and people of the level of this deen. And I ask forgiveness if I went on for some time.